I'm well aware that the mind collide got cancelled and it's not being developed anymore, but he's not dead. We, the remaining Michael fans, are still talking about it now and then. And that's what's important. We must stay together and keep it alive any way we can. So what I'm going to do is review every single one of the biologies. Analyze its story and its characters. As well as having fun just looking back at my favorite things and even try to solve some of its still and answer questions that remain to this day. You may follow me, you may not, but I'll still do it. Because that's my contribution to that. I'm Lord Vinicles, and this is Bionicle, Rise of a Phenomenon. Hey there, Bionicle fans! Welcome back to another episode of Bionicle, Rise of a Phenomenon. In this 2003 episode, we'll be taking a look at Bionicle's last of the good old days years. What Bionicle fans tend to call the good old days is a period of time in which the story was just about to have one the other two off fighting against Makuta's Minios in the island of Matsunu. Before the flashback years didn't make a trilogy or even the serious magnet arc. A simpler time, and it was also the most symbolic time for the whole Bionicle line. As you all know, there were two different story arcs in 2003, which made me decide to divide this review in two parts so I can analyze them better. The Bionicle team had pulled a successful year again with the Borok saga, but eventually, the time to come up with next year's story was closing in. Since the beginning of time, the Bionicle team had a story bible, which contained all the story elements and all the secrets which gave Bionicle its beloved mystic. In order for the line to keep being interesting, the story team would have to reveal some of those secrets eventually. Although not all of them, since it will rob Bionicle of its mystical essence. Now, Lillian has it that one of Bionicle's creators, Bob Thompson, had planned to divide Bionicle's entire story into seven books. Each of them would be a different story arc, which would then connect with the next book in order to get to the final one and complete the cycle. Remember, at the beginning, Bionicle was intended to last for 20 years, so these seven books will contain the overall story of each of those years. There is little information regarding the legitimacy of these legendary seven books, what we can assume is that they will divide Bionicle's story into the following. From 2001 to 2003, it will be the quest to return the Matoran to their homeland. From 2004 to 2005, it will be the flashback of Vakama's island home. From 2006 to 2008, it will be the quest to save Maranui's life. And from 2009 to 2011, the quest to find the great beings. There is no official confirmation to prove this assumption, but if it is remotely true, then that means that there are another two books that we have no idea what story we to tell. Nevertheless, I'm sure there would have been also. As you can see, the first book had the years of 2001, 2002, and 2003 in it. So, in order to connect it with, ne with the next book, the Bionicle team decided to unleash some of its most heavily guarded secrets from the year 2003. While they were on it, the level of security were witnessing Lion's profitability, and seeing how there was such a huge fan base built around it, they decided to step their foot into new marketing territory like they had never done before. They moved it. You see, at the beginning of the 21st century, the CG animation movies were such a huge deal that they were on the top of the movie industry. So many companies were starting to produce these movies seeing how successful they were, and Lego was about to do the same. But there was one little problem with that. Lego had no experience doing movies. So what they decided to do was to include the whole 2003 year story into the movie so that kids could watch it and understand it in a very simple and easy way. So, with that being said, such were designed and a story was written which all resulted in Bionicle, Mask of Light, the movie. Now, allow me to throw my own personal theory right here. Having the story established and turned into the movie script as well as the set story rendered to CG animation, the Bionicle story team realized the story would not hold off for a complete year. Since the movie would not come out until September, they had to find a way to calm their hype fans who were dying to see the movie. Not having enough time to really structure a strong story and develop brand new sets, the only solution they could think of was to divide the year into two sagas, as well as introducing some kind of filler arc in order to make time for the movie to be released, which resulted in the infamous Borok Call. What do I mean with a filler arc? If you have ever watched anime, then you have definitely come across a series which has to create some kind of filler arc now and then so that the anime and the manga don't get too close to each other. Unlike those anime series whose filler arcs are not canon and never actually happen in the storyline, 
the borough call where can I? So what was the story for the first half of 2003? Well, after defeating Bara, the two and Nuva went back to their quarters and witnessed a ceremony held by their respective Turaga, who explained that since the Mata had become Nuva, they now depended on a Nuva symbol, a stone plate which contained the elemental powers of each of the Toa Nuva. However, the symbols would have to be kept safe. If they were to fall into the wrong hands, then the Toa would lose the elemental abilities and therefore become powerless. With the Barak in prison, a lead squad of Borok awoke, but these were not Emerald Borok, they were Kal. Wearing advanced versions of the Krana known as Krana Kal, they could still function without them, talk to the Pathologian Matron language, and additionally did not depend on the Barak's orders. They could act on their own. Also, they wielded new elemental powers such as electricity, gravity, magnetism, sonics, vacuum, and plasma, which they would not hesitate to use in order to complete their one and only task, to free the Barak from their prison. Holy Kanoki! If regular really borders are to be prolonged, now imagine these mighty, clever, unstoppable and rebellious robots which have been unleashed in the Isle of Matsunui. Think the great beings are just six of them, precisely because they cannot uh, they don't have to obey the barak if they don't want to. Had there been an entire swarm of border cow, then the border queen wouldn't have been able to put them under control. Now, help me a little bit here. There is something I've been wondering since the year two thousand and three. Well, more than ten years after that time, and I haven't still answered that question. How many border cow could a border call the border could call border cow? Fast and cunning, the Borokawa managed to sneak inside the Matron villages and steal each of the Nuva symbols, leaving the Toa Nuva powerless. Because of that, they were not able to prevent the Borokawa from finding the Barak's location and gathering the Borok swarms back to their nests. Following their trades, the Toa Nuva arrived back to the cave in which Kadok and Gadok lied, only to watch the Borokawa about to free their masters by putting all the Nuva symbols together. But Tahu, wanting to save the day by himself, literally pulls the trig out of his armor. He suddenly gets a Kanohi Vahi, or Mask of Time. What? How? Why? I bet you my promotional CDs of the Borok called that nobody, not one single Bionicle fan saw that coming. He came out of nowhere. What we should have gotten was a setup building up towards that object of power, like uh, we could have seen uh, Toro Bakama giving Tahu the object inside a bag so it was hidden and we couldn't see it. Something like that. But no! Taku just summoned a brand new Kanohi that we have never heard of, and on top of that, it's a mask of time! More powerful than shielding, water breathing, levitation, exhibition, super speed, or enhanced strength, all combined together. It's one of the fundamental energies of the universe, and Taku has it! And don't get me wrong, I don't want to sound angry or mad, but the problem is that we didn't have a proper introduction to it. I'm guessing that the Bionic Story Team feared that uh, the Borokal Saga was not going to be interesting enough or wasn't going to work at all, so they surely pushed the red emergency button for plot to sting the story. It's an element so conveniently thrown in, and there's no need a man convincing excuse for that. True this, the Kanoki Vahi was the first mask made by LEGO. They had originally planned to release it along with a PC game called Legend of Matanui, which got cancelled before completion, leaving the Mask of Time available only at some promotions in the, in the United States. So, will Tahu go back in time to prevent the Borokal from stealing the Nova symbols? <laughs> Fortunately not, as time travel is very confusing, and quoting Greg Varsity, a perfect way to ruin a story. Instead, Tahu slows time around the Borokal so that the rest of the Nova can take their symbols back. But it doesn't work, and Gallic devises a plan which involves the Nova summoning their energy through the symbols so that the Borokal get charged with so much power that they can't control it. All of the border cal end up being destroyed by their own abilities, and the new escape the cave with their symbols and elemental powers back. The sets from the first Island of the Interest and the three were great! That's because it looked like Borox. As you can see, they're practically identical to the ones you saw in 2002. You can see that there are just a couple of things to distinguish them from the previous Borox sets. They now have silver plates in their heads with some markings over there, and they have now different new shields as this. Um, the Krana were also from different colors, but that's not really a big difference from the ones you saw last year, like, and here you can see this, this crown, yeah, but it's not a big difference, but it's not the same designer's fault, they had really no time to produce new sets, nor the budget to make them, so their only choice was to take the previous sets and change just some of those pieces so that they could still be purchased by kids and, that it, and so that they could be affordable for the Lego company to make them. If not, then there would have been no sets and the first holiday of 2003 sales would have dropped to zero. At least with this borough, they could still like hold off for the second half of the year uh, so that the Rashi could save the line. But, yeah, there is nothing much to say about them. 
This concludes the first part of the Rise of Avanon episode of the year 2003. Be sure to check part 2 for all kinds of interesting information regarding the second half of the year 2003. Thanks for watching.